kind of shifting our focus now, looking at some of the ethical issues that AI is raising. And for that, I have invited Dr. Jason Thacker. Uh, he's got a master's, Master of Divinity from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's currently pursuing a PhD in ethics and public theology. Uh, one of the things he does is chair the research and technology ethics and leads communications in the, at the ethics and religious liberty communication of the Southern Baptist Convention. And most recent, well, I don't know what it's most recently, but one of the things I've uh, appreciated reading is new book, The Age of AI, uh, has a subtitle, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. That seems to be a popular theme. And so uh, just really looking forward, uh, going to invite Jason to come in here. Jason, it's good to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Look forward to what you have to say and uh, just uh, help us understand some of the ethical issues concerning that. And uh, we'll do that for about 35 minutes, come back and uh, interact with you with a panel of myself and Joe Miller. So uh, go at it. Let us uh, tell us what we need to know about ethics concerning AI. Well, I can say in one 30 minute lecture, we will not be able to cover everything, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to raise some important questions and be able to start a dialogue, which is really what we need when we talk about ethics and artificial intelligence. So the title of the session is Ethics in the Age of AI, Defining and Pursuing the Good for Our Own Good. Often when we read or hear about artificial intelligence, we see one of two reactions, either, either a fear of the unknown, often accompanied by this dystopian vision of the future, or we see a sheer excitement and kind of optimism about where technology is taking us towards this type of utopian future. Or to put it another way, we see a deep pessimism towards technology or a great unbridled optimism. Both of these reactions are understandable in many ways because of the nature of technology and how these tools have already been revolutionizing our society in countless ways for both good and for ill. In one way, fear of the future can make sense because we look out over the rise of artificial intelligence and even other emerging technologies and how these tools are beginning to automate nearly every aspect of our life from our homes and our social media accounts to our weapons and even our work. What if we lose control of these machines? What if we even lose our livelihoods to them? Many of those raising alarms to the deleterious effects of technology are quick to point out that often these companies will put profits over people. They often push for a slower adoption of these tools by society overall, and some will advocate for even bans on certain technologies, such as AI weapon systems, or even the current ban, or the current pushes to ban the use of facial recognition technology in our society, which has been growing in use throughout our communities by police and other government agencies across our nation. But these cautions and warnings can often fall on deaf ears because it seems that Others are ready to usher in this utopian type future with all the promised benefits of technology. They'll seek to push the boundaries of what's possible with our technology and look forward to the countless innovations and benefits that these tools will bring to our society. This position is often characterized by the Silicon Valley mantra of move things and break, uh, move fast and break things. This wait and see, or is this really a problem mentality is common in certain circles as dangers are often downplayed and possible future benefits are put front and center. Even if those seeking to capitalize on certain groups are often using people as merely a means to some end. Ethics is often seen as a nice addition um, to the work that we do in technology in our society. And it's often sacrificed or gives way to more important things. The question of can we often trumps the question, the ever important question of should we? of the moral life. The best path forward with artificial intelligence and technology can be difficult at times to discern and the ethics of their use can be very complicated, especially with the diverse views of what is the good in our pluralistic society. For all the good that can be brought about by these tools, there's often a number of dangers and what are those dangers and how do we identify them? Is there a set of principles or guidelines that we can all agree upon as we navigate this age of AI? Is there a moral tradition that's better, that better addresses some of these challenges of these tools and allows us to focus on the humanity of our neighbor while still pursuing God-honoring innovation? In this session today, I want to briefly introduce you to three key ethical kind of areas within uh, the debate on the rise of artificial intelligence and then help us to chart a course forward with the ethics of AI grounded in the Christian moral tradition of loving God and loving neighbor. Each of these three areas of ethical concern that we'll discuss kind of center on a particular question 
a particular question of what does it mean to be human? And this is kind of one of the most foundational questions that we've asked throughout human history, but one today that needs particular clarity because of the ambiguity surrounding human nature, it can lead us to use technology and namely artificial intelligence in extremely dehumanizing ways and to give immense power and promise amidst these tools. One of the biggest ironies I think in this age of AI is that we often develop and use these tools uh, and seek to humanize them in many ways at the same time that we're seeking to devalue or even dehumanize our fellow man. Often these machines are, we have these vain kind of sci-fi dreams of get, having strong AI or even conscious machines, but then we're still dehumanizing our neighbors and treating them as less than human or less than the image bearer uh, that they represent. Ethics is not a nice add-on addition in our pursuit of technological innovation. It must take a central role in this technological society to quote, uh, the, or to use the language of the prescient uh, philosopher of technology, Jacques Ellul, because nothing short of human dignity is at stake in the midst of these questions. And Christian ethics specifically can point us to the ultimate good and helps to guide the innovations that we pursue as we seek to honor the dignity of every person as created in God's image. The first of these ethical areas that we'll discuss is the use of facial recognition and the privacy issues that ensue in this age of AI. We'll shift over to the changing nature of work and automation. And lastly, we'll touch on the weapons of war and the need for human responsibility with artificial intelligence. And we'll end our time talking through how Christian ethics actually serves as a stable and wise grounding for the ethics of AI as we engage a couple of the prevailing kind of ethical worldviews of our day. About a year ago, actually this month, Kashmir Hill of the New York Times broke a story about a little known startup company called Clearview AI uh, that's been in the news even recently. And this company had developed a controversial facial recognition application for policing and government surveillance. This simple application allowed users, namely police officers and those in security and government uh, affairs to receive the name or the identity as well as all known public photos of a person that they would upload to the system. These photos came from a host of locations across the internet, including photos that even the subject may never have known that would have existed, such as uh, from social media feeds and other places online. Often these pictures where they might be in the background of a stranger's photo or even had a photo taken of them without their knowledge or consent. The application became a source of national inquiry and intrigue because Clearview AI had partnered initially with over 2,200 local law enforcement and police departments across the nation and initially had plans in, to expand into commercial opportunities. Law enforcement officers found the technology extremely useful. They were able to identify suspects, break up in cold cases. They also found the but they also found the technology to be incredibly invasive into the personal privacy of the general public who likely had no idea that this application even existed before Kashmir Hill broke the story in the New York Times. Throughout the world, highly sophisticated AI surveillance systems like facial recognition are being used to track, identify, and direct people all over the world. Recent global events such as contact tracing efforts in the midst of this outbreak of COVID-19, the continued systemic persecution of religious minorities like the Uyghur Muslims in China, and even the overdependence of upon facial recognition in our policing, where it has been known and studies have shown that African Americans are routinely misidentified by these AI facial recognition tools. This has challenged the way that our world thinks about surveillance technology. Even just this past week in America, the Clearview AI announced that it had seen a massive surge on the platform as police sought to identify those involved in the assault on the United States Capitol from photos and videos of the riot. And especially in light of the bravado of companies like Clearview AI that really pushed the ethical bounds in the ways that they obtained these photos and built out their algorithm. There's a lot of questions about what is the nature of this good? How can we utilize these tools wisely? There are a host of ethical issues that are included here, but they're not limited to the nature of privacy, the real presence of bias, especially racial bias, and the algorithms, the propagation of discriminatory practices that could be seen in our law enforcement or other security contexts, or even the loss of religious freedom and movement from people across the world that are simply being tracked and detained because of their ethnic or religious identity. 
In the age of AI, it becomes even more uh, easy to dehumanize our neighbors by seeing other people created in God's image as simply bits of data rather than image bearers made in the very likeness of God that Genesis 126 and 28 tell us. These facial recognition tools can be utilized for immense good, but they're also used in the pursuit of power and control over large swaths of humanity. The immense power of these tools can feed this allure of power that inevitably will lead to massive human rights abuses and violations as this technology as we question if this technology should be banned outright or can it be used in ethical ways and harnessed in ways that uphold the dignity of every human being. Other questions are, do we actually have a right to privacy? Who should or shouldn't have access to these powerful tools? Should they be utilized without our consent or knowledge? These are the debates that are happening all across our society and our world right now. And many of us have not simply slowed, slowed down to engage this complicated topic in light of a robust Christian ethic. Another prevalent ethical issue with AI is starting to be how this type of technology is revolutionizing the nature of work and how we view others in light of someone's worth or contribution to society. The AI revolution is often mentioned in terms of what's called the second digital age with the advent of computers being the first or the second machine age, which the first being the industrial revolution. With the rate of change in this AI revolution, many are rightfully wondering what the short-term, but also the long-term impact of these tools will be on our work and on humanity as a whole. But if we're to view uh, this current revolution through the lens of history, we know that there will likely be massive shifts in our society in terms of the nature of work itself, the jobs that are available, and also a quite possibly an explosion of wealth and prosperity for more of human civilization than ever before. Automation and AI are transforming industries ranging from transportation and manufacturing to medicine and even journalism. Take for example, the transportation sector. You likely have heard about the uh, rise or the future rise of autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. According to the American Trucking Association, there are approximately 3.5 million truck drivers alone in America. Add that to the number of professional drivers that work in shipping, food delivery, and transportation, and that number can quickly rise to over 10 million people with driver as part of their uh, substantial part of their job duties. And if autonomous vehicles are ultimately deployed in mass throughout our society, we will experience a massive cultural breakdown if these workers aren't able to transition careers or even keep their current jobs. This breakdown will not only affect the drivers themselves, but also their families and their communities that they live in. As joblessness increases, studies show that substance abuse and sexual immorality are also prone to rise as people are trying to deal with the psychological effects of being jobless and having, um, having their job taken from them. And this is just one segment of society. The potential social upheaval in our communities is massive. And some argue that there's really nothing to fear though because humanity is adaptable and we have ultimately weathered these type of revolutions before, but maybe not at the scale of AI. Some jobs are replaced, others are augmented and many new jobs will also be created. The future of work is a very complex ethical question, but at the core of the debate has to be what is the meaning of work itself and how God created us to work as his image bearers. Some of the ethical questions surrounding AI and work are how we might uphold the dignity and value of work in an age that's increasingly automated and digitized. Certain forms of labor may very well become obsolete or at least highly automated. So how does this technology affect how we view our neighbors in light of their dignity as individuals? Is our work simply a means to an end, a means to provide for ourselves and our family, or is there a deeper meaning to our work? Should the government provide for those who lose their jobs due to automation in what ways? How are we to harness these tools for our work? How should the church even care for those who lose jobs and how might we go about retraining large swaths of the public that do lose their jobs due to automation and AI. Some of, the big, some of the biggest questions that have arisen from this last year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the loss of millions of jobs worldwide, might be a microcosm of what we face moving forward in the age of AI. Because so often we as 
as a society tie our worth and our value and our dignity and that of our neighbor even to our contributions to society rather than seeing each other as infinitely worthy and created in God's image. Lastly, one of the most discussed and, even, and easily one of the most consequential impacts of artificial intelligence on society, it really surrounds the use of military and wartime applications of these technologies, especially due to the role of humans in decision making. There have been countless debates over the use of tools like these in warfare and the ethics behind the decision making. While it's so easy to conjure up red eyed killer robots or out of control weapons, we have to think a lot more broadly about the use of AI and military applications. Because reality is, is that many of our current we weapon systems, especially in the United States, have already been equipped with some form of artificial intelligence. And we're already starting to replace humans in the decision making loop. A, the role that humans play in this decision-making loop for these weapon systems is often portrayed in what's called the OODA loop. This loop has four stages, observe, orient, decide, and act. And this was developed by military strategist and United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd for the use in all military applications. But as decision-making for identifying and engaging potential targets is increasingly automated and augmented, humans will naturally become less and less involved and less and less involved in the loop because of the speed at which these life altering decisions have to be made in war and combat. Automation is being used to search out, identify, track and pri uh, prioritize potential targets. This increasingly puts the human what's called on the loop or even out of the loop. On the loop systems are actually very, very common in today's mil military technology. These systems include the ship-based defense systems like the US Aegis combat system or land-based systems like the United States Patriot missiles. These systems operate independently, but have a human able to intervene at any time in case something goes wrong. This helps to retain control and human responsibility if the system malfunctions or even makes a bad calculation. Out of the loop systems can be described as what's called fully autonomous weapon systems. These systems can perform most operational tasks, but a human being is still in control of the system with a manual override. But how long will this level of control last when artificial intelligence systems have to become faster and faster? How are humans gonna be able to retain that control? Even today, we have systems that border on full autonomy or even start to cross that line. Israel has one such drone system named the Harpy, which was developed in 2004, which can, is considered what's uh, called a loitering munition, which means it's given a certain target area and it can engage targets that come into that area as it sees fit. This system is controlled by a form of artificial intelligence, and there's really no need for humans to approve the target before the system engages. We've seen this with other um, industry, um, other industries and military technologies like the mini harpy, the harpo or the harpy that have become smaller packages and easier to deploy. And these systems have already been sh uh, shared and sold with numerous nations like China, India, South Korea and Turkey. And even South Korea themselves, they have a sentry gun that's developed by Samsung that sits in the demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea which has been said to have a, a flip of a switch can go from semi-autonomous to fully autonomous, depending on what's to come. These AI-based weapon systems are not some futuristic sci-fi movie plot. They're real life and they're already defining and defending our borders and our skies. The question is not, are these technologies possible, but where does the responsibility for their use lie? How are these systems to be used in just war and defense? How are nations uh, seek to use these tools or should we ban these type of technologies given the immense weight of responsibility for the potential, of human, uh, loss, potential loss of human life? And what if other nations don't abide by these same ethical standards that we have? Will we fall behind in what's called the arms race or be vulnerable to an automated attack? How are Christians even to think about nature of just war and the value of it, human life, even though the value of our enemies? The weight of the ethical decisions before us as a society is immense and honestly can be quite overwhelming, even for the most gifted ethicists and technologists and theologians. But given these kind of large three ethical areas within the age of artificial intelligence, 
how are we to move forward and how do we define a Christian ethic for the digital age? As I said earlier, it's going to be very difficult to do that in a 30 minute session, but we'll try our best here um, because we're not able to get into a lot of the nitty gritty and a lot of the specific questions, but maybe we can bring some of those out in the question and answer. But in the time that I have remaining, I want to point out a few ways that our neighbors and our society is beginning to address AI ethics and how these ethical formations often fail to address the core moral issues that we have in the digital age. And then briefly, I'll lay out a Christian vision for ethics in the age of AI. It probably comes to no surprise that AI ethics is an increasingly popular topic. Between Google's AI principles, the United States Department of Defense recently adopted guidelines regarding military use of this technology, or even the European Union's proposal for an ethical framework for AI. Our world is longing for direction in addressing some of these complicated and even life-altering technologies like AI in ways that are good, fair, applicable, and ethical. But as we've seen already, facial recognition is challenging our notions of privacy. Automation and AI are challenging our, the nature of work and our understanding of work. And autonomous weapon systems are raising serious concerns about the role of war and our responsibility to pursue justice in a broken world. Scholars and practitioners from across political, ideological, and philosophical spectrums are starting to debate how and if we should use these technologies, as well as some of the pressing questions of what does it mean to be human? Many of these popular ethical principles are focused on, you'll see as a common theme as a principle of fairness as a major objective. Fairness, though, is often a very vague concept because it can be misused or abused to pr prioritize one group over another or even to silence the positions of those who are outside of the mainstream in society. And our digital age society often trades conviction in a grounded ethic for what I call a fashion ethic, which is an ethic that's defined by what's popular or what might impress others. We often take ethical stances on what will put us in the in crowd or what will earn us social credibility. We claim that one form of injustice is wrong, but another is okay because they are the wrong type of people. We proclaim that our enemies, our political enemies, often are on the wrong side of history as we scramble to curry favor from a particular voting block or a group in society. Such ethical formations are often marked by desire for notoriety or for influence. We see this with philosopher Slavzor Zizek, who alludes to fashion ethics when he talks of green capitalism and the choices that businesses often make to go green in order to be seen ethical and to gain a larger market share. He argues that we assuage our guilt over environmental issues in order to be seen as ethical and by purchasing these green products in ways that we want to be seen as environmentally conscious by other people. And businesses know this, and they often change their models to entice us to shop there. This was similar as how many businesses across the world reacted after the landmark Supreme Court decision of a Burgerfeld v. Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage in America. Knowing that it would often help their brand if they were seen as supportive of same-sex marriage, they changed their social media avatars to rainbows. They loudly proclaimed that love is love, even if they had never engaged in this issue before. This ethic was based less on trans, uh, a conviction or a transcendent truth as much as the fashionable moods, kind of the in crowd, the in ethic of the day. Because our society has largely abandoned any type of sense of a transcendent or a revealed ethic, we often define the good based on what other people think of us and ultimately what we want and what we desire. But this isn't just true of our consumeristic habits. It's true of the technologies that drive many of us uh, drive the, our day. Influenced by the rise of postmodernism, our society has become increasingly relativistic when it comes to ethics and religion in particular. We're open to people having their own views on ethics and morality. What's good is ultimately what we want in life. If it feels good, it must be true. If we think it's true, then it must be good. And there's a subtle irony in this relativism, though, because when we talk about the nature of empirical research and science and technology, our society is very postmodern, isn't very postmodern when it comes to our technology and our sciences, but we are in our ethics. We push for hard facts with the scientific method, and we believe in this unchanging truth about the way the world works. But our, that objectivity, that same objectivity, doesn't invade our ethics and our moral understandings of the world. 
Many brilliant thinkers have spent their entire life's work seeking to discover a science of morality and often to no avail. And many others have created ethical systems in order to deal with the pressing issues of the day, often because of a, this adverse reaction to the core tenets of a transcendent or a revealed ethic. You see this in Neil Postman's famous Technopoly, where he describes how our older systems of ethics and morality are just simply ill-equipped to deal with the challenges of our day and the questions that are being posed by these advanced technologies. Thus, we seek to shed these traditional sources of moral guidance and exchange them often for vague concepts of fairness or equality. I believe that we're at a very interesting turning point um, in terms of ethics and technology, since our technological developments are based on a modern framework, while our ethics and our, are often both based on a postmodern framework. This is one of the reasons that there's so much confusion about ethics in our day, especially with questions surrounding the good use of artificial intelligence. We often become so enamored with what other people think of us and our individualistic versions of truth that we struggle to address many of the technological developments, lest we offend someone with the error of some type of settled or objective truth. As technology continues to impact and affect every area of our life, we cannot depend on vague generalities to make these ethical decisions. Our dignity and that of our neighbors is at stake. Take, for example, the first of the recent Google AI principles, what's uh, deemed as be socially beneficial. This sounds like a laudable goal and something that we could all support, but if you take a really deep look at what they mean by that, it's incredibly ambiguous. What does it mean to be beneficial? What if my, ben my definition of beneficial is different than yours? What's, who is it going to benefit? The majority or the minority? Who decides? Who decides who decides? As you read these explanations, it becomes clear that there's a subtle form of utilitarianism actually framing this ethic, and I quote from the, that first principle, as we consider the potential development and uses of AI, AI, AI technologies, we have to take into account the broad range of social and economic factors. And we will proceed from there when we believe that the overall likely benefits substantially exceed the foreseeable risk and downsides. It's clear what Google is saying here is that they are gonna pursue what brings about the most good, even though that good is often left undefined and vague. But as we all know, every person exhibits some type of bias or discrimination in the ways due to our sinfulness and our pride, and that can spill over into our ethics. And while Google has every right to pursue this course of action as they develop these powerful AI technologies, the public also has a right to push back on these vague utilitarian arguments and seek clarity about how these potentially life-altering technologies will be developed and used. And the Google AI principles are actually released on the hills of this infamous Project Maven project that they were working on with the military. They partnered with the United States Department of Defense to help develop an AI system that could help comb through countless hours of drone data, video data. The AI system was being trained to identify and automatically label targets and objects within the video data. Google actually pulled out of the project due to an uproar from their own employees who thought that Google shouldn't be involved in the weapons or tools of war and that these technologies must be employed in a fair and socially beneficial way. The irony here is that this type of partnership between technology farms and the military actually allowed them their right to protest in a free society. But these protests raise many questions, though. What is the good? What is right? What is moral in these situations? How does fairness in this context line up with our safety of our brothers and sisters on the battlefield? What is fair and socially beneficial about terrorists or rogue nations having, having the advantage on the battlefield? Without clarity on the details of these ethical principles, it comes increasingly difficult for our society to think wisely about the roles and the power of these technologies. As technology gets folded into nearly every aspect of our life, it's nearly impossible to avoid these conflicts between what is true and what we want to be true. What if the church had a better way forward, one that brought light to darkness and clarity to the murkiness of our ethical decisions? As Christians, our ethical decision-making cannot be tied to the prevailing attitudes of certain elites or the in-crowd or what's called the right side of history. 
at the most basic level, a Christian ethic is a transcendent or revealed morality. Not only did God create each of us in his image or in his likeness that we read about in Genesis, but we, he also spoke to us and he revealed to us how we are to live as his image bearers. Jesus Christ himself summed up the entirety of the Christian ethic in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, where he said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second was to love your neighbor as yourself. To quote the esteemed theologian and ethicist Carl F. H. Henry, love is another is love for another is the whole sum of the Christian ethic. Henry goes on to say that God first loving us is a summary of Christian doctrine, and us loving him is the summary of Christian morality. Now, while this might seem simplistic, especially given the immense ethical challenges that we that we spoke about earlier, this simple yet profoundly robust ethic is more than capable of helping us to face some of the most complex and challenging questions being posed by artificial intelligence with a hope and a resolute faith in our God as our creator. The Christian ethic runs contrary to the prevailing moods and ethical outlooks of the day because it forces us to look outside of ourselves and to others rather than always focusing on what we want and the things that we desire. Naturally, in Christian ethics, there's questions that are being raised about what does it mean to love God and what does it mean to actually love our neighbor? Simply put, to love God is to follow his commandments. This is what we read about in 1 John 5, 3. We, it means sacrificing our sinful desires and pursuits as we seek to love God more than we love ourselves and to love those whom God loves as we obey his commandments and follow after him. It means for us to be who God created us to be, to live in the way in which he designed us to live, and to honor the dignity and value of every human being as a fellow image bearer of God. And by loving others and putting others before ourselves, we will take a very distinct view of ethics and technology, especially with AI, that can be so easily used to dehumanize our neighbors and treat them as simply a means to an end or a means to self-preservation, power, and control. As we saw earlier about the rise of facial recognition, automation, even weapons of war, it's easier than ever to dehumanize or subjugate our neighbors as we, in a bit of irony, seek to humanize our own machines. In this age of AI, the Christian ethic calls us to live in a certain way that reflects the goodness of our creator and our love for our neighbor. It reminds us that while we are still each individuals with an interior nature, this isn't to be exposed for everyone to see, even though we don't have a true sense of privacy before our God. Our God is all-knowing, but he's also all-loving, and that standard of all-knowing and all-loving is something that our fellow man often fails to live up to because of our sinful natures. The Christian ethic reminds us that while there is some kind of value in our contributions to society, our work does not define us as, our, as human beings. We're created to work in God's good design, even if our work might look different than expected in the light of artificial intelligence and the technologies of the future. A Christian ethic also helps to remind us that even though our enemies, we seek justice in this world, we also bear the weight of responsibility because our enemies, too, are also created in God's image. And we must seek justice as we seek just war in our combat. And even as machines and AI might subtly shift how we go about seeking justice and peace, our role as image bearers and the call to love our neighbor does not change. So as we debate the dangers and the merits of emerging technologies like the cost of facial recognition systems or how algorithmic biases disparage minorities or how AI-based weapon systems are being deployed in our battlefield, we must remember that we're called to apply this robust Christian framework of ethics centered on the dignity of every human being to every single area of our decision making and our moral decision making. The Christian moral tradition is based on this concept of human exceptionalism, which runs contrary to many of the materialistic type of visions that are so prevalent in science and technology. And this is why we must keep human dignity at the core of our ethical framework. We're to claim that God, who are we to claim that God, the creator of the cosmos and the universe, who knit us together in our mother's womb, doesn't actually understand what is good for us and what ultimately will lead to his glory. We're called to love our neighbors, to stand up for their rights and the dignity in an incredibly complex world. As technology and influence increases in our society, we must be reminded that we have a steadfast hope 
and a robust ethic to engage the issues of the day from a place of hope and faith rather than this debilitating pessimism or even this unbridled optimism. Christians have a steady hope in the midst of an uncertain future because we know that our God is above all sovereign over history and that all of humanity and that nothing will ever change or supplant the image of God that God has created us in it. Well, thanks, Jason. I really appreciate your comments. There, there's uh, kind of a fire hose, just a wealth of things to think about here. I guess um, uh, before we get started, I want to invite uh, Joe Miller in here. Uh, uh, Joe is a uh, architectural engineer from Penn State, got an MDiv from Oral Roberts, Dr. Minute. Doctor of Ministry from uh, Biola, finishing a PhD in Ethics from Midwestern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, been a pastor for over 20 years, or in pastoral ministry for 20 years. And I guess my first question, just quickly to you, Joe, um, since you've been at Midwest Baptist, are you now properly a Kansas City Chiefs fan? Well, I'll be a bandwagon fan any day. I grew up and raised a Pittsburgh guy, but uh, I, I'm glad to cheer for KC. I'm <laughs> glad to see him get off the bottom of the barrel of the NFL. All right. Now, I just having grown up in Kansas or just north of Kansas City, it's been nice to see them do well recently. I will say that much. So, uh, but more on more serious matters, uh, uh, Jason. As I'm listening to your talk, one of the questions I just have, I, I think, uh, the issue of ethics as we're dealing with AI is uh, an enormous issue. And, and I'll throw this one out just to start. Um, you talked about how a a, a Judeo Christian ethic. Uh, worldview really anchors or grounds or help us deal with all of the things that come up. But I guess my question is, given that we kind of live in this postmodern society where everybody seems to have, uh, I've got my own truth, or that's kind of the way we operate, how do we do that uh, in the context of AI? It seems essential to do it, but it seems almost impossible to make it happen. Yeah, and that's a really good question, um, kind of the practical outwork outworkings of that. And part of it, I think it's twofold. One, we as scholars are called to equip people, equip people in our churches, equip those in our communities to start thinking about some of these ethical issues in light of human dignity. Um, it's kind of a rallying cry often um, throughout our society and throughout the world about human rights. And that's a good conversation. And I actually think that's a very good place to start having these conversations about uh, artificial intelligence and technology. And while Christian, the Judeo-Christian moral tradition would ground a human right differently than most of our society, that is a common language that we can talk through and uh, talk about in light of like the United States, or excuse me, the UN um, Declaration on Human Rights in the 50s, or even going back to the founding of America and our constitution about the dignity or the value or the rights of every individual. I think we can start there, but part of it is living this out. It's going to be part of it is educating and equipping our churches and our people to be thinking through these issues and to be thinking through them in light of Christian scripture. But two is modeling that. I've spoken to a number. I'm not an AI practitioner. I'm not a developer. I'm an ethicist and a theologian. But as I meet and talk with those working in the field, they're living that out in the ways that they're thinking about or developing these tools with their teams. And so they can model this kind of like, what's the cost here? I know that this might bring us more profit, but what is that going, going to do to X, Y, and Z group? Or how is this going to, how can this potentially be abused or misused? And so it's not that we're hiding our Christianity or this kind of morality that we approach these things with, is that we kind of infuse that into the decisions that we're making, the conversations that we're having as these tools are being developed, and then let that spread more widely into our communities as we're having debates of the merits of facial recognition. Often people want a clear cut answer, should we ban it or not? And for me, I actually say we should slow down in our adoption of these tools because we simply do not understand some of the impacts and the ways that these uh, tools are gonna be changing our society or seeing some of the, the bias or the discrimination that may unknowingly or knowingly be present in the algorithms. We need to slow down and recognize what uh, is actually taking place and to be thoughtful about how we approach it because that slowing down runs contrary to our society that continually wants to speed up and go faster and faster and faster. And I think as Christians, we can slow down and start to ask some of these deep questions and have a robust dialogue about these really pressing issues. 
But that, that actually kind of highlights some of my, or I guess wrestling with this is that, I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I really do. Uh, the idea though of going out and slowing down, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've kind of adopted an approach of I try, uh, after learning from my older kids, I've tried to give my kids phones much later or, or other things. Uh, but I'm, it seems like I'm the only one doing that. I know that's not the case, but it's like, you know, everybody else has one. Um, so even if within the context of the church, we struggle with that, is there any real hope of having, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this one. Is there any real hope of having that sort of approach when society just seems to marginalize that viewpoint? It seems like I almost have to live as though there's no hope in actually making a change, live it out, because that's all I can do. And, and if it does, then I can be pleasantly surprised, but I can't really expect that my views are gonna have that much change in the way society goes. No, I think that's a really good way of, yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I'll give you a story, for example, of how this is, I've seen this kind of play out in my own life, in my own ministry, in my own research. Um, back in April of 2019, the organization that I helped lead technology ethics for released um, an evangelical statement of principles on artificial intelligence. And while it, I later found out uh, that it was actually the very first faith-based document, AI principles in the world, um, even though the Roman Catholic Church had been working in these areas for a number of times, they had never solidified until just recently what's called the AI, um, the call, I think they call it like the call for ethics or something like that. And what it was um, this document is explicitly biblical, Christian, evangelical, talking about the inerrant, infallible word of God. And we played some of these issues out in terms of sexuality and work and privacy and warfare, kind of in these principles. And I noticed this really interesting uh, interaction that I had. I had people within the church agree and disagree, understandably, on certain points of theology or faith or ethics. Um, but I also have people from outside of the church uh, in secular fields and the scholarly academic world saying, I don't agree with you on the image of God or God or the Bible or any of that, but I really liked what you said about work. Hmm. And so what, what we're doing as we're critiquing some of the modern worldviews, especially the ethical kind of frameworks of our day, is people see that these things are not perfect. They don't always line up. They don't always make a lot of sense. I mean, for all of the popularity of Peter Singer and his practical ethics, a lot of people, even secular people, vehemently disagree with him and the way that he goes about kind of in many ways, even at, at advocating for infanticide, saying that these aren't persons because they're not X, Y, and Z. So thus, it's okay to take their life if it's convenient, necessary, and there's some type of benefit for it. And so I think that that kind of modeling this hope that's where I started to see a lot of folks say, we agree with you X, Y, and Z. We can't go across the line here, but we're really interested in you talking about human dignity. That's kind of interesting. And what I think we're you're, I, picking up is the way that the Lord, I mean, Paul talks about it in Romans that we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The truth is the truth. God's truth is truth. Even though we might seek to suppress it in unrighteousness, there's still kind of a, a oneness to it. That doesn't mean that we're going to usher in some dumb or anything like that, or even if we try to do something like that. But what it does mean is God's truth is the true universe. It's this natural law, that way God has created the world to work. And that's when, and so I'm not going to say that we're going to see some massive kind of Christian revolution in artificial intelligence. What I am going to say is that a lot of the principles are surrounding human dignity are winsome and actually can gain us not only a hearing, but even a seat at the table to engage some of these pressing questions kind of in, in, within that framework, even if they don't agree with where that, uh, where that framework is grounded. Joe, I want to invite you. Do you have any thoughts, comments, or questions here for Jason? Yeah, you know, your last comments there kind of touched a little bit on what I wanted to ask about and, and answered, I guess, to some degree. I guess I just see that there's this there is this a big challenge there. I noted, uh, I think a couple folks mentioned this on the um, chat as well. So, I mean, we certainly as Christians, I think the idea you use the word a lot of time dehumanization. Um, you know, the idea of treating people as less than based on some sort of criteria. But it seems, though, that like AI, at least through this transhumanist, you know, 
uh, vision, you know, they assume that there is no such thing or there's no stable or persistent definition of human. You know, what it, what it means to be human is always changing and evolve and evolving. So, um, I mean, science can't, you know, they struggle to find terms like life and intelligence. So as artificial intelligence, I guess, is seeking to reimagine what it even means to be human, um, to reimagine humanity, I guess, an image of what we think humanity should become. Um, how do we, or first, I guess, uh, the real question is, do you even see any secular people genuinely worried about that concept of dehumanization? Or is it more just along the lines of, like you said, um, maybe points of interest, where we talk about maybe even vague things of uh, injustice or fairness or specific issues, um, you know, facial recognition it is, is it just on the surface that we share those concerns or are there really anybody out there that you're reading who doesn't have that Christian worldview that really shares in that uh, concern over the actual dehumanization? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. I would say that I don't, I'm not reading a lot of folks without the outside of the Christian tradition that are using the language of dehumanization per se. But I think they're getting at a lot of those concepts. Um, and that's what you see even in some of the even Google AI principles or that of the European Union or even the United States and Department of Defense and even kind of the AI initiative led by this administration have put forth things that kind of start to hint at or kind of talk about dehumanization without using that exact language. I think because that's one of the things I think is one of the most important challenges of our day is we need to define what it means to be human because that is in such flux within throughout our society. And that's leading to a lot of ambiguity and problems in these ethical frameworks. Um, and I think people are starting to see that. And that a good example of this is kind of through the early 2000s up until like 2010, there was this really unbridled optimism. It did, what big tech was in, everyone loved what, how it's happening by and large. I mean, there were concerns here and there but by and large, there was this kind of unbridled optimism. I'm starting to see, I mean, after the 2010, 2012, up until today, you're starting to see a deep pessimism towards technology and kind of the deleterious effects of technology. And I think that kind of awakening to saying, hey, these tools are really powerful. So while they might not use the language of dehumanization, I think they're starting to pick up on some of those concepts. And you, I see that specifically with the kind of the battle in many ways over facial recognition is people across the board are saying these tools are one incredibly powerful and can be extremely useful but look at the way that they're misidentifying people of color where you're having false arrest happen in detroit where a man is arrested in front of his his wife and his children and taken to to jail all because an ai said that's your guy and come to find out it wasn't. The AI made a mistake because it's actually not trained very well on people of color and their faces. So I think there's kind of this subtle dehumanization that people are starting to pick up on, on how these tools can be used um, and will be used. And even seeing right, human rights abuses across the world. I mean, thinking of we have millions and I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke here. I'm saying millions upon millions of Uyghur Muslims are in basically concentration camps in the Xinjiang region of China. And we're just starting to kind of wake up to that and realize like, this is wrong. And why? Because they're human beings, their rights, their dignity, they don't always use that language, are being violated by this authoritarian regime bent on retaining power and control over their people. And so I would say that while we're not maybe using the language of dehumanization per se, you're starting to see some of these dehumanizing effects of technology. Does that mean that that's always going to be the case? I don't think so. I think there'll probably be an, another season of unbridled optimism uh, soon. Um, but I do think that people are starting to say these tools are powerful and they're questioning and asking these questions. And this is a unique opportunity for Christian scholars, practitioners, technologists to step into these conversations and say, I have, a, I have a way of talking about this that's, that's uh, clear, coherent, that aligns with what we believe is the truth of the universe, but really helps to shed light on these abuses and helps us to have a path forward 
of saying, let's focus on the dignity of all people rather than just sheer market share or, or profits. We need to think more holistically about the way these tools are affecting other human beings, which we would say other image bearers in that sense. So let me, I'm going to try and take a step back and you just get a little bit of insight into how I, I try and encapsulate these things that I can think well, because this is, I mean, the whole area of AI is huge, but even ethics within AI is huge. Um, is, how would you answer this question? Is AI good or bad? I would say that's the wrong question. And I don't mean to offend you, Jeff. No, no you're not. The re Go ahead. The reason I say it's it's so easy for us to say, okay, is it this or this? Just give me the answer. If mm -hmm. I have the answer, then I can move forward. The reality is life is much more complicated than that. These tools, I don't think are inherently good, nor do I think they're inherently evil. I think they can be used by human beings in inherently good or evil ways. But you kind of get back into this, this is kind of the big discussion within a lot of philosophy of technology circles is uh, technological determinism versus technological, um, uh, blanking out on the word all of a sudden, um, the tool-based approach uh, to technology. Mm -hmm. And so is it a tool? Can it be used for good or bad? Or is it inherently flawed and evil or in inherently dangerous? Um, and the ways that it kind of impacts and influences our life. And I think we need to be as Christians a little bit more thoughtful when we approach these things. These, they are tools. I mean, God has created us. I talk about in the book is that God had, we, the kind of the big questions that we have to address is who is God? What is he like? And who is he? How has he created us in his image? What does it mean to be human? And then what is technology? I do believe technology is a tool, but it's an incredibly inherently powerful tool that has kind of society shaping effects to these tools outside of the immediate use is the way the broader application is Martin Heidegger would say the web of relations. Um, he takes a more instrumentalist view of technology, but I think that language of web of relations is really helpful for us because it helps to broaden kind of our understanding to say, you know, is the front door camera on my house good or bad? I think that's the wrong question because what it's saying is, do we see kind of the full effects, this web of relations of why not only do we have that camera placed in this specific context in this time, there's a history. We had the rise of the internet, then we had the rise of online shopping. And then the more online shopping, the more packages you had delivered at your front door. And the more packages you had delivered, the more fear or anxiety you might have. Someone would be a porch thief or a porch pirate and come take your packages. So we created this tool. And then the way these tools turn into neighborhood watch programs and the ways that police can end up using that, that data and have basically a network of cameras watching an entire neighborhood at all times. There's good and there's bad in that. And so I, instead of saying, is technology good or or is AI good or bad? I think we have to step out and say, there are good things here. There are bad things here. And a Christian kind of moral tradition would help us to recognize that and to say, then how are we ultimately using these tools to love God and love our neighbor? Or are we rejecting God and dehumanizing our neighbor as we try to prop up ourselves? And so I think we have to think a little bit more holistically about technology and specifically AI. And you're seeing that and a lot of the secular literature as well is kind of a rejection of this instrumentalist approach. I just think that the deterministic approach, um, this kind of, it, this is the logical flow of history. This is where we're going. This is Jacques Ellul. I love Ellul, but I really disagree with him on this lack of hope and change. I just think a Christian worldview kind of takes a more balanced approach between these two extremes. No, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I concur with your assessment that the idea of being good or bad is the wrong way to look. And, I, you know, the, for uh, put a little bit of what you said in my terms, it's like AI in some sense is a tool. Um, you know, you can use it for good, you can use it for bad. Uh, um, it, it does seem to me, though, that, uh, you know, a hammer is good or bad. I can go out and destroy things and I can build a house with it. Um, a car is good or bad. I can drive, I can commit crimes with it. Um, on the flip side, while a car is a tool, if I give my car to a 10 year old, um, I'm being negligent. Is AI such a powerful tool that we as a society might not be mature enough to deal with it? 
Definitely. Um, and why I'm so emphatic about that is you even see that with facial recognition. That's the big debate over facial recognition. Um, this tool is incredibly powerful. I mean, right now, uh, Clearview AI's t technology is being used, which I have very huge, I have a lot of issues with the way that they built out this algorithm, scraping photos from across the internet, Venmo, Facebook, Twitter, everything. They scraped photos that were publicly available. Um, I don't, still don't think it was the right or the ethical way of going about it, um, but they were able to build this incredibly powerful uh, facial recognition system. And you're starting to see the ways that police, police and government officials are utilizing this tool and don't understand the limitations because they're sold by the slick marketing slogans and the gadgets and the ways that, you know, Clearview AI is out to make money. Um, so they're not going to tell you maybe all the inherent dangers and flaws and the reasons you might not should use their technology. They want you to use it because they want to make money. Um, that there's this over-dependence and not recognizing or seeing how these tools not only can be misused and abused, but how they might be inherently flawed or how they might have limitations that you don't understand. And so when you upload a photo of uh, a suspect and it says it's Joe Smith and you go find Joe Smith and you arrest him and book him, and then come to find out the AI, it was a 99, it was a 97.5% uh, accuracy rate. Well, he fell within the one, 2% there, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's dangerous. And so that's why I don't, I'm not saying like, let's slow down and go back to some like pre AI time where everybody can sing Kumbaya and everything will be great. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that we can, we need to recognize the limitations. We need to recognize that it's often the ways that these things are marketed is overblown or overhyped. And we need to have clarity with the limitations of these tools, the ways that these can be used in good and bad cases and recognize, and this is where I, I get some pushback from a lot of folks. I, that doesn't mean that we don't pursue innovation because in many ways, even specifically with weapon technology, uh, if we don't pursue it and pursue, even if we decide not to use them, um, if we don't pursue it, someone will. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like that argument, but I, I don't see another way around it is that if we don't develop these tools, other nations will, and they will start using them against us. So this idea of like these outright bans on fully autonomous weapon systems to me is incredibly short-sighted. I understand the reasoning. I actually may support some of the, the uh, kind of ethical issues that they're bringing on saying, yeah, that is a problem and that's really dangerous. But by not pursuing them, we can get behind and actually have these tools used on our own people. And so I just think it, you have to, again, take a more balanced approach. Banning something, we've only been able to ban certain weapon technologies, a few in the history of mankind, um, you know, mustard gas, things like that. But there are still places in, that have them. That right. doesn't mean that we can't slow it down. This is a really complicated debate on the bans, and I won't get into that. But I just do think it can be a little short-sighted to say that, well, we'll just stop pursuing this. No, other people are going to do it. So let's do it ethically. Let's do it as the leaders of the free world. Let's try to pursue these things and use them in ways, as I'll go back, to uphold the dignity and value and worth of every human being. So, so let me ask one follow-up, and then I want to give Joe some opportunity more to engage, too. Um, given that it's... Uh, you know, I, I clearly think, uh, you know, again, that uh, Christian ethics really has value here, given the kind of fractured nature of the way even Christians think about it, and even how the, the secular society thinks about it, and this incredible capacity for harm. How should the church go about making its case to society about this? What, what, what do you think would be effective in helping make that case? I think first and foremost, oh, it's kind of twofold. Um, one, I think, is going to be educating our people on these tools. And that does not mean that you host like an AI workshop for your church. Like that's probably not going to be the best way to serve people. What it does is we can bring up the ways that technology in our preaching and our teaching, um, in our conversations and our community is we can start to bring up these things and start talking about them. Let's have conversations about it. I know for a you know, perfect example is my mother who uh, is 66, I think this year, about to turn 67, um, is incredibly fearful of AI. 
And if you read my book, I actually, there's a reason that my book doesn't have a hundred footnotes and isn't an academic volume. I wanted my mother to read it. Mm -hmm. She's not going to read an academic treatise. She wanted to read, this is the, it was a popular level book. And, but the thing is, is I was able to put that in her hand. And she even told me, she said, I work in the medical field. I'm really nervous about what AI is going to do to my job. I work in accounting. I work in HR. I work in, um, she kind of oversees management of her office. If we start automating these things, am I going to lose my job? Mm -hmm. Well, so often we take these AI ethical questions and keep them up in these kind of academic circles um, and these kind of big societal shifts, not recognizing that the people just like us, our mothers, our fathers, our brothers, our sisters, our friends and neighbors are hearing about AI. All they're seeing is red eyed killer robots that are going to come kill you or take your job. That, Cause that's the sensationalism that we often see in media is there's this new report came out. Everyone's going to lose their job. Um, reality is that's probably not going to happen, but they don't get the balanced approach. And so by equipping them and handing them resources or talking through these things and having these conversations, I think that's one way we can start to model a Christian Judeo Christian ethic in these really tough conversations. The flip side of that is we need to be training Christians to enter into these fields. There are a number of faithful believers who it's okay that they don't have formal ethics training. That's why God gave me the abilities and the thought and the desire even to pursue these type of things. My job is to help equip the church. And I say broadly the church to engage a lot of these eth ethical questions and have the resources to be able to do that wisely. So on my podcast uh, called weekly tech, I actually interviewed a computer science PhD student who's working on facial recognition systems and how to fool them. Um, it, it's a way that she has that they altered the face, but the computer sees it, but the human eye doesn't see it. So the computer can would read back a negative output, even though the photo is of that person. Hmm. And so, but she was sitting there and she was asking me questions and saying, well, how do I address this ethically or theologically? And then she was teaching me about the ways that the systems are developed and used. And so I think we need to have that robust dialogue and partnership between those who are called to academics and ethicists and theologians and those who are called to be practitioners and giving a vision to say your ministry at, for young people, your ministry and the ways that you serve God can very well might be sitting at a computer terminal or working on an AI team or working in the biomedical technology field. It doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor. And I think that's something within the church we often see as ministry is pastoring or missionary instead of seeing all of life as ministry. And that we have people in our pews that are gifted, gifted scientists and practitioners and mathematicians who need to be equipped with some basic ethics and theology, but need to be in these fields, creating these technologies, developing these technologies, pursuing innovation, but doing so from this kind of Judeo-Christian uh, moral tradition or this understanding of uh, create be others being created in God's image. And I think giving that language to them is helpful as they pursue these innovations. And then as likewise, they also teach me all things, all, uh, all sorts of things all the time. I no, appreciate it. Joe, Joe, uh, I invite you to kind of come and ask. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as you were talking, man, it's, it's really interesting because uh, one of the things that came to my mind, especially talking about facial recognition, uh, and how it's potentially being used uh, and it misidentifies, especially, uh, you know, certain people of color and all that court of potential for abuse and that I couldn't help but think of, uh, you know, eugenics stuff in the early 20th century and, you know, phrenology and all these other, you know, looking at facial features specifically, um, you know, th these ideas that certain facial features were uh, associated with criminals. Uh, or certain facial features were, you know, would, would lead to other certain, certain lifestyles. And I just saw, yes, two days ago, I think it was, an article because of all this Trump stuff that's going on and the riots at the Capitol. I just saw an article come out that uh, AI can identify who is most likely, uh, you know, going to be a conservative or a liberal in their, in their policies just based off of, you know, facial recognition stuff. And so you, you take something like that and you look at the history of where, how we've used those sort of external features and qualities to make assumptions and then drive moral choices. And then you take that generic goal you mentioned about Google, you know, do what's for the, the, 
the greatest social good, you know, and right now our greatest social good is, you know, silencing any certain, this voice or that voice. And that, and like you say, it's sort of the, the picture du jour. What is it today? What will be tomorrow? We don't know of who we need to silence or these sort of things. And it seems pretty ripe for abuse in that idea of taking these generic contexts, con, you know, concepts of social good, taking AI and like you said. So I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to, because I happen to think that I think issues of race um, and what we can model in terms of uh, human sacredness and dignity and rights, I think that's probably one of those inroad issues that we can maybe gain a foothold. Um, you know, again, if it's misreading people of color now, and we used to do that and other things, maybe we can show people, hey, there's a, Christians have some, a valid concern here. Maybe you could speak a little bit more to that, what you're seeing is, is has, have you had those conversations on the race side of things? Has that been persuasive for uh, a certain segment, especially maybe younger people or who, who's buying that argument right now? And, and, and where have you seen that take effect? Yeah, and that, that's a very interesting point and question there. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of my work especially as I've worked with technology companies, I'll often people think that like ethicists and theologians just kind of stay up in our little ivory towers and write and pontificate. But no, I'm at, like meeting with the technology companies and talking to them. It's really, really interesting because I think Christians, especially today, we have to be really honest about our track record on social issues. We have not been the best. Let's just be real honest in terms of race issues, in terms of um, issues of women and their rights and value and dignity, um, a host, a host of issues. And often the church, one of the reasons that I, I kind of started out on this path of AI ethics and technology ethics was simply because so often the church has played catch up to the culture. And what I mean by that is over the last century or two, the church has lagged behind recognizing the value of women, recognizing the value of other races, especially African-American brothers and sisters, and even playing catch up on issues of abortion or marriage or sexuality. And often what we do is we play reactionary to these social issues rather than getting involved and in stepping into the conversations as they're happening. And so instead of playing catch up, I think that the AI specifically is an opportunity for the church to step in as the conversations are being had so that we're part of the way kind of helping to shape the narrative and the ways that we go forward as a nation, as, as a society. And so I think there's part of that. One of the things that I've noticed too is um, when I step into a lot of these conversations and I talk about issues of race, there's kind of these, are, you're, hold on, you're a conservative Christian and you're you're, that's the way you're talking about other, and it's like, it's kind of mind blowing because so much of our life is caricatures we treat each other as avatars. We, we bicker and anger and argument and post these incredibly terrible, often ad hominem attacks and going after people's mor morality and credentials. And we said, go to Adam. But when you have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone and you sit across the table or in the age of pan the pandemic, we have to sit across Zoom with one another, you recognize there's value and dignity in every human being, even my perceived political enemies. And the Bible is really clear. That we're our battle in this in this world is not against flesh and blood. It's not against our fellow image bearer. It's about the principalities of power and evil um, in this world, and that's who our enemy is. And so, I think as Christians, when we engage specifically in these kind of ethical issues around technology, we have to be aware of one of the ways we're going to be perceived, but then also is kind of countering those perceptions and talking about the fullness, talking about the dignity and value and worth of every individual. As I said earlier, some often in these conversations, you know, a secular academic or ethicist could, they, it's laughable that I believe in God. Okay, I'm talking about human dignity. You're talking about human rights. Let's talk about where there's overlaps. Maybe there are things we agree on. Maybe there are ways that we can partner together um, on certain issues, but we might not be able to partner on others. And so I think that we have to re retain our distinctiveness and not being ashamed, this is something I've really loved about Dr. Lennox, especially in his book, 2084, is that he kind of helps you to not be ashamed of your beliefs. Um, it's so easy in our world to be 
uh, ashamed of what we believe and not want to publicly or very loudly talk about what we believe because we think we're just going to get made fun of or ostracized or sidestepped. Um, but reality is, is that you step into these conversations, you have these face-to-face conversations, you can really gain a hearing. And that's because, again, I kind of goes back all the way to the way that God has created the universe. Um, the things that we're talking about, it might sound arrogant, but they're true. They're objectively true. Now, we might struggle at times to gain hearing or to be winsome or to share these truths, but ultimately, every knee is going to bow. Every person is going to recognize who God is at the end of days. And so when I talk about AI, that's one of the questions I get come the popular question, are you fearful of AI? And I say, no, I'm never, I'm not fearful of AI. I'm not fearful of technology. And the reason is because I know what Revelation 21 says. I know that all of us are going to be gathered around the throne, worshiping, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is God. Jesus is on his throne. These aren't questions. These aren't debates. This is the reality of what's happening. So he calls us to live faithfully in a very complex situation, addressing extremely complex ethical system or ethical questions of the day posed by these technologies. But we do so from a place of hope and peace and love. These virtues that the uh, Bible speaks of is that we can have these virtues and we can engage people, even though they might disagree with us. We can do so in love and in kindness and in truth. Um, knowing ultimately where our hope is. It's not in being accepted. It's not in getting something published. It's not in something having the right answers to the right questions at all times. Ultimately, our hope and faith is in God. And so that's where we can engage these things from a place of kind of resolute faith and hope and peace um, in really, really tough times. One of your comments there that I think... uh given how much time we tend to spend on social media, and I don't know if you've seen the social dilemma, but just given that it's driven by engaging you in the social, um, I I concur with your statement that when I've had personal conversations, they're far different than they're on social media. Would you uh, maybe advocate, or what would you say to the person who says, perhaps we ought to not not shun technology, but try and avoid it to be engaged in more personal interactions? Uh, What would you say to that? I think that's a laudable goal. Um, I, I advocate, especially in terms of social media, this is a project I'm working on right now, kind of an, another book project is kind of the ways that social media or the social internet has been discipling us um, as believers, but as a society at large, shaping and forming us. And this is kind of those, that web of relations, that kind of more deterministic approach to technology. Um, but I'm using the language of discipleship is it's shaping and forming us into certain types of people. It's kind of like that slot, slot machine mentality. Um, this, I really enjoyed the social dilemma in many ways. I thought it brought out some really helpful issues and the ways that these technologies have been designed to kind of give you that dopamine hit. They've kind of, that slot machine is, if I pull it again, maybe I'll get what I want. Or if, if I pull that, if I pull that uh, refresh down on Twitter, maybe someone will have tagged me. Maybe someone would have shared something as a, as a scholar and academic, maybe they've shared my article, maybe they've shared my book, like this kind of always longing for something more. And these companies know that. And so they've kind of built a market on it. But I think it's short-sighted and kind of myopic to think of, well, we'll just reject all these technologies. We'll just get rid of them. And I just don't think that, again, that goes back to your initial question, Jeff, is, is technology good or bad? I don't think we need to take that approach, even with social media. It's like, how do we utilize these tools of wisdom and care, ultimately kind of back to that paradigm of loving God and loving our neighbor? Sometimes that's going to mean stepping away. Sometimes that's going to mean for me personally, and some people don't agree with this and some people don't. I have blackout hours on my social media apps from about 830 at night till seven o'clock in the morning. So I don't lie in bed scrolling to see what's coming next. It also helps me because I have a full-time job and academics and research and writing. Like you just don't have all the time in the day just to spend hours upon hours on Twitter. Um, But what it does is setting in some limits, slowing down. That's countercultural, this idea of slowing down in an increasingly uh, faster society. And it's, it's kind of, you're starting to see some of these kind of deleterious effects and society is waking up to them. That's the thing I appreciated about the social dilemma is that people are starting to say, whoa, whoa, hold on, let's slow down here. What's going on? Where, why is this designed this way? And how is this capital? How is this shaping or molding or even uh, spreading like 
through these engagement rates and the way these algorithms are designed uh, for engagement, how are they propagating the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories? Well, we saw a pretty blatant example of that on January 6th at the United States Capitol about the ways that social media can influence and change and shape someone's worldview. So I think as Christians, we can slow down, we can set in proper boundaries, we can utilize these tools, but I think we fool ourselves into thinking that we'll go back to a pre-social media age. We'll just get rid of it and I don't have to engage on it at all. I'm not saying you have to. Some people are called to, some people might be called to step away, but we're not going back. Like, I think that's the thing. And we, there is kind of a progress. There is kind of this natural progression in te and technology and in society. We're not going back to yesteryear. And honestly, I don't know if I want to go back to yesteryear because it had its own problems. So as a Christian, I'm called to step in to be in the place and the time that God has called me and created me to be, to take the wisdom that he's given me, this kind of moral framework of loving God and loving neighbor and applying it to the issues in front of me. Maybe it does mean to love God and to love your neighbor, you need to get off social media. Maybe it's that you need to have time limits. Maybe that you need to have accountability. Maybe it's that you need to have broader conversations with people around you and prioritize in flesh conversations or in the pandemic, Zoom conversations. Like, let's be more thoughtful about the ways that these technologies are discipling and shaping us. Um, and by being more thoughtful, hopefully we'll see better results. We'll see a... Um, upholding the dignity and value and worth of every human being, including ourselves, and not being pawns in this larger scheme to make money or uh, to influence other people is to say, no, let's, let's be who we are. Let's take responsibility. Let's recognize the power of these tools and step forward in faith. Well, thanks, Joe. Or uh, Jason, I really appreciate you being here. Joe, thank you for your contributions as well. Uh, you know, as, as you mentioned at the start, there's no way we were going to cover this in our brief period of time, but I think this has given us some really good things to think about and really kind of emphasize the highlight or, or the importance of growing in Christian discipleship, because I think that just informs how we think about all these things. And 